Welcome to the NWAETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Underwood, and I'd like to turn it over to Brian Wood, our medical director, to introduce our guest. Great. It's a pleasure to have Dr. Devika Singh with us today. Uh, Devika is a provider uh, involved in the Microbicide Trials Network and also an educator with the STD and HIV Prevention Training Center. And she will talk today about diagnosis and management of vaginitis. Thanks, Brian. It's thr I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, this is a topic of great interest for me. Uh, it also happens to be something that you commonly see, for all of you, I'm presuming, see female patients, and it's particularly uh, something that you're going to commonly see in the setting of HIV as well. Uh, so uh, I have about 15 minutes to work with, which uh, makes it very difficult to be very comprehensive. So primarily, my focus will be on bacterial vaginosis, so we'll talk very specifically about that. I want to acknowledge my boss, my mentor, uh, my colleague, really one of the premier researchers in the field of vaginitis here based at the University of Washington has done considerable work in the area of bacterial vaginosis, uh, specifically in trying to understand a lot of the sexual dynamics, partnerships, the etiology, the pathogens associated with uh, this clinical entity. So uh, acknowledgement to Dr. Marazzo, and I'm using a number of her slides as well. We're going to start with a patient history. This is a very, very typical scenario. Uh, perhaps you've already had this. This is a 28-year-old African-American, uh, well suppressed uh, uh, as far as her HIV on antiretroviral therapy, and she calls you over the phone uh, because she's noted increased vaginal discharge for about a week. And I'll stop by saying one thing, and that is women have a very reliable sense of stating when they have abnormal vaginal discharge. Uh, all women of reproductive age will have some vaginal discharge, and there may be cyclical variation in it, but she will be the most reliable person uh, to tell you that there's something unusual about her discharge. She provides no history of any known bacterial STD. She has uh, one new male sex partner she's been with for the past two or three months, and she smokes a pack of cigarettes a day. Upon further uh, history, she tells you she has uh, some bit of genital itching. She noticed uh, that uh, the discharge is kind of whitish uh, in color at times. Um, she's unsure about whether this has a foul odor. She continues and says, you know, I've had a yeast infection. This feels just like one. Um, I know. I know my body. I know that. I know that that's what I have. So. What are your thoughts at this point? And is it, number one, she probably has a reliable sense of her symptoms. Do you want to just call in a prescription for fluconazole? Or she probably has bacterial vaginosis because of how common it is, and so you'll call in a prescription for metronidazole. Number three, both she and her partner need testing. Number four, all of the above or none of the above. And th this, this case was really trying to prompt you to think about sort of your usual approach to this kind of a scenario. Number one and two are very tempting. You, you want to believe that she has a reliable sense of her symptoms, but I can tell you that although women have a reliable sense of their symptoms, they do not have a reliable sense of the etiology. So her conveying to you that she's had a yeast infection and this feels like a yeast infection does not really demonstrate that that's probably what it is. It may be true, or she could have bacterial vaginosis, she could have trichomoniasis, she could have a combination of, of other things. So. It's not the most reliable thing to trust her report, and it's also not reliable to trust your own sense of it over the phone. So believe me, decades of research has really demonstrated how poor we are in evaluating vaginitis in the absence of a clinical examination. It's also tempting to say she has BV. She is African-American. She's HIV infected. She has a new sex partner. Uh, I didn't mention, but uh, she's intermittently using condoms. She uh, is a smoker. So all of these things put her in the risk pool of, of having an increased uh, risk for BV. Um, but again, without a clinical evaluation, you don't know that she could also be co-infected or have a, a different uh, cause of vaginitis or uh, another bacterial STD process altogether. So really, at minimum, what you need to do is have her come in, pH testing, wet prep, uh, microscopy, uh, KOH, uh, that kind of thing. And you, you ought to be able to get at least some results, uh, especially between uh, determining between vulvovaginal candidiasis and BV early in your evaluation. 
BV is, ex is exceptionally common. Uh, it's the most common cause of vulvovaginal complaints, 29% in the N. Haynes data set none, done a number of years ago, and that's probably an underrepresentation. Exceedingly prevalent in areas of the world with a lot of HIV prevalence of so Sub-Saharan Africa, over 50% in studies done on women residing in rural Ugandan villages. As you know, it generally responds to anaerobic treatment, metronidazole, clindamycin, tinidazole, but the challenge of BV is that 15 to 20 percent of women fail initial therapy, and even with an initial treatment response, recurrence rates are upwards of 75 percent within one year. So what does the normal vagina look like? Well, it's healthy, blissfully acidic. Those are normal-looking epithelial cells with lots of very protective lactobacilli in the surrounding. Uh, the major lactobacilli species are L. crispatus and L. Jensenii. They, Jensenii. they produce hydrogen peroxide, and that sort of infers the maximum vaginal benefit. Uh, Nugent scoring is done uh, generally in a research setting for evaluation of BV. <coughs> I just showed you Nugent score zero. You can look at the, the uh, the, the depiction on the right, that's, ex, you know, an extraordinary amount of, of bacterial pathogens, uh, anaerobes, uh, typically Gardnerella, BV-associated bugs, BVAB1, 2, 3, et cetera, um, and a lot of distortion of our usual vaginal epithelial cells. You're typically more used to diagnosing uh, BV with AMSL criteria. That's, that continues to be standard uh, clinical practice. So the presence of homogeneous discharge and elevated pH and the presence of greater than 20% of clue cells, as well as the positive WIF test, which is the emanation of anaerobes uh, with the addition of KOH. This is what it looks like, uh, sort of a skim milk adherent uh, discharge on vag vag vaginal epithelium. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, BV in the context of HIV and demonstrate to you that there has been a, a lot of data um, to, to show increased risk of HIV acquisition among those women who have BV. This is a study, this was a meta-analysis done uh, uh, back in 2008 that really reviewed 23 studies, a risk, uh, looked at a population of greater than 30,000 women, and the prevalence was really, you know, 70 percent in a, in a number of different populations that were studied, uh, but overall, 60 percent increased risk of HIV acquisition among women uh, with uh, BV. Craig Cohen and colleagues here at the University of Washington did another analysis looking at the Partners in Prevention data set. This looked at over 2,200 HIV positive women um, who had BV and looked at the transmission of those women to their uninfected male partners and really ultimately found sort of independent association with increased risk of HIV transmission, threefold increased risk. So, the male uninfected partners partnered with HIV positive women uh, with BV had threefold uh, increased risk of acquiring HIV. We'll talk a little bit about recurrent BV with this case. So this is a, a very uh, similar sounding uh, uh, profile, 28 year old woman with a single male sex partner. She's now on her third episode of symptomatic BV in the past six months. She's desperate. And which recommendation is supported by published evidence? Is it suppressive metrogel biweekly for six months, nightly boric acid for six months, intravaginal yogurt to replenish the vaginal lactobacilli? What about treating her male sex partner with a course of oral metronidazole or finding a new health healthcare <laughs> provider? Uh, and, and the answer is Jack Sobel out of Michigan State University has done a considerable amount of uh, uh, research on vaginitis, really found a lot of support for Metrogel biweekly and a randomized controlled trial for suppression uh, of BV. Uh, so really 26% in the metro arm versus 59% of the placebo arm. What you can see, however, is that there's an observation phase of three months when they're off of therapy. And although the numbers still demonstrate sig uh, statistical significance, there certainly is increased recurrence in, in the arm of individuals that were on the metro gel. 
If you look at the numbers six months, nine months later, you kind of lose the benefit uh, that you had in the twice weekly gel. Um, and, and so that, that benefit essentially goes away the more remote you are with the regimen. This is a recent randomized control trial done by uh, uh, Katrina Bradshaw and folks out of Australia randomizing uh, 450 women with BV with standard week-long therapy of oral metronidazole and the addition of vaginal clindamycin 2% cream versus lactobacillus vaginal probiotic versus placebo cream. And the ultimate end result was very discouraging. BV recurrence was overall 28% with no difference between the groups. So the addition of the vaginal clindamycin cream, or for that matter, the probiotic, really didn't make a difference. They went ahead and did an additional evaluation with the same, with the same group of individuals. Uh, this was published very recently, actually last month, uh, adjusting for age and sexual frequency, sexual practices. What they found was recurrence was associated with having the same pre- and post-treatment sexual partner, so an adjusted hazard ratio of 1.9, as well as inconsistent condom use. And so that's not a very surprising result, actually. So that, that is the inconsistent condom use. The interesting thing, though, that these were women generally who had the same regular sex partner. So we're really kind of trained to think of new sex partners making these women at particularly high risk. Uh, but these women actually gave a history of the same sex partner. That's not inconsistent with some of what we already know, actually. And that has to do with sort of concordance uh, of BV within partnerships. So uh, including research that's been done here out of the University of Washington, looking at the, the same findings of BV associated bugs with male sex partners of the index patient with BV, as well as among those who are paired with women, so among lesbians and bisexual women. So the same BV bugs really cultured out of sex partners. Um, with penile cultures done, PCR testing, pyrosequency of genital, of genital samples. So really interesting, uh, interesting findings regarding sort of the role of the partner, whether it's necessarily always a new partner or whether there's more and more evidence to suggest actually your regular partner could put you at some risk as well. The inconsistent condom use, again, not surprising. The most interesting part about this research study actually showed that recurrence of BV was halved among those who used an, used an estrogen-containing contraceptive method. Uh, so that was kind of an, an impressive result. Um, and I will tell you that, that that's not an entirely completely new finding. About a decade ago, there was some research done on the Nuva ring. And among those women who were using the Nuva ring, they had increased populations of protective lactobacillus uh, versus those uh, who were on actually um, oral contraceptive pills. So it, it, it indicates some role of estrogen, perhaps some role of combination uh, hormonal methods for really being protective uh, to, for the vaginal epithelium. So these are the recommendations uh, for treatment of BV, you know, easy to look up on the CDC website. So recommended generally uh, either the oral uh, versus Metrogel versus clindamycin cream. So, uh, you know, oral, oral carrying its own risk for those who are, are using alcohol and that kind of thing or who have other intolerances. Um, certainly tinidazole is another option used a lot more in other global settings than, than we use here, um, as well as clindamycin. So um, this is just a little bit of information about tinidazole um, as an antimicrobial. The half-life is about twice that of metronidazole. Again, sort of the same usual precautions surrounding no alcohol. This is category C in pregnancy, so we do not advise that it's used in that setting. Um, Pretty sort of, um, you know, efficacy is about one gram daily for five days, 64% for, for tinidazole, the two grams uh, for two days, 46%. So um, some evidence uh, towards kind of pointing to tinidazole as possible <coughs> options for recalcitrant BV that's certainly been trialed. Uh, or certainly been tried uh, clinically, anecdotally, uh, with some success on some occasions. 
So in conclusion, I really want to just stress that vaginitis is common. The diagnosis warrants a clinical examination. It's associated with increased risk of HIV acquisition for the female, uh, for, for the patient herself, as well as increased risk of uh, transmission to uninfected male partners. BV is tragically very recurrent, very challenging to treat. Um, some research showing strong association with sex partners and certainly inconsistent condom use. Uh, an interesting finding to suggest a protective role for estrogen-based contraception. Um, so I want to end with that. I have many more slides. I believe you all will have the access to my full slide set. I, I actually go through some trichomonas um, evaluation, trichomonas testing, uh, as well as the, the reminder and the recommendation to use the longer course therapy for HIV infected in, uh, individuals uh, uh, supported by some data a couple of years ago. So I will stop talking for now and entertain any of your questions regarding uh, BV management and diagnosis.